first, autoimmunity has as its premise that we are genetically programmed as mammals to respond to things that are foreign, such as pathogens, bacteria, viruses. Um, it, we respond to things that in our own bodies change and become foreign, like tumor antigens, because we do a lot of immune surveillance and destruction of, of the, the first cell or two that is a malignant transformation. And then we're supposed to equally and faithfully not respond to anything that's self. So you might imagine that there's really not like two immune systems, you know, one that won't recognize self and one will do all this, this rapid damage to anything that could be foreign and harm us. And in that overlap lies sort of a set of genetics and a set of principles that invoke the idea that there has to be some kind of triggering exposure that allows ultimately that you start to react against an antigen that is self and you fail to regulate that or to cease that reaction. And we have regulatory mechanisms that stop our immune system because when you fight an infection or a virus, that immune system after it's finished goes away. Otherwise, we'd all be one big lymph node, cumulative of every, every ongoing r rapid response that we've ever had. So it has to start, it has to finish its job, and then it has to stop. And we think that the, the, the start is a trigger, environmental trigger, we believe, in this disease. And for actually many autoimmune diseases, we have the same concept. We don't have much of an idea of what it is. Then we think you have to have the right immunogenetics in terms of the kind of response you're about to make. You make your response, but then the final step to get to disease is you can't turn it off. So what do we know about PBC? We know that PBC has one of the most pristine autoantibody and autoantigens profiles of any autoimmune disease. It is the very small components within a large enzyme that lie inside our uh, energy factories, the mitochondria. And this particular little component of that enzyme complex is in, found in about 98 to 90 or 100 percent of patients with the disease as a marker of autoimmunity. They've made an autoimmune reaction against it. Now in those few patients that don't have that, if we were to take out their cells and study them, they're highly reactive to the same antigen. So the question then is, well, what's that antigen? Because it comes from mitochondria, it's in the mitochondria of every mammalian species. And when you step back in evolutionary terms, mitochondria weren't evolved from human beings. They were evolved from bacteria that came to invade and to live in symbiosis in our cells. Now without them, we wouldn't be sitting here because they take oxygen and turn it into energy. But they really are bacteria. They have their own DNA, they have their own life, and it's independent of our DNA and our genetics. So this is the complexity of the, of the human being. So you might imagine that one of the trigger prospects is a, is a uh, disease reaction where the pathogen that's being destroyed by our immune system that also has mitochondria, also has these enzymes, is reacted to as a mimic. And what we fail to do by not turning it off is we allow it to spill over and attack our cells. And then we ask, well, okay, why would it attack the bile ducts? Well, the bile ducts of, that line these small and medium caliber ducts where the cholangitis focuses its attention, they uniquely handle things like the mitochondrial proteins. And it suggests that th that unique handling makes them particularly susceptible to an immune reaction against them. So th that's what we're thinking right now is important. Now with other autoimmune diseases, a totally different autoantigen, probably a different environmental trigger, and somewhat different, but uh, somewhat similar, I immunologic genetic background because the genetic background of autoimmune diseases, plural, tends to be overlapping. It has some general characteristics that if you have it, you're prone to all the autoimmune diseases, then it comes down to the trigger. Now, the triggers, we think, are probably frequent. 
and the regulation can't be all bad or you know there'd be a problem early in life so then you have this other dimension of what else has to be there at that right time to make it a disease rather than something that ultimately is turned off so lots of food for thought lots of investigations in all those areas and uh, hopefully uh, a breakthrough in one will lead to breakthrough understandings in others because they are linked okay anything else you would like to answer well, I would like to um, always urge that in this day and age where we have the ability to diagnose things early, we are obviously attempting to make diagnoses in people who are without symptoms. And the consequence is that when a person has liver test panel, which is part of multiphasic testing, you would not get a, a normal panel of biochemistries without containing those tests that the patient in seeing a report that has an abnormality or a doctor who sees a report of abnormality follow up on it. All too commonly, kind of close to normal but clearly not normal, is looked at by saying you look great, you feel great, there's probably not anything going on, why don't we watch it? Now for some patients that's going to be interpreted, particularly if you're young, as doctor just told me I'm fine and the watching it part falls away and there's not any follow-up. For some cultures in particular, that is really an endorsement that I'm fine and that I don't need to see the doctor unless I feel sick and symptoms are too late. We wanna intercept these diseases early. So my plea is that we intelligently use the normal ranges and when something's abnormal, we at least think about it and pursue it diagnostically. Because if you're unfortunate to have the disease, it's not gonna get better by waiting to find out you have it.